Um, now I'm going to introduce Marianne Dreyer, our speaker tonight. Marianne is the Global Education Curriculum Developer for Cl Densefly Serona. Her focus is on ultrasonic instrumentation, local anesthesia, and radiology technique. Her experience in, in dentistry spans over 30 years as a clinician and an educator. She is a graduate of Forth Forsyth School for Dental Hygienists, Old Dominion University, and received her Master's in Education from St. Joseph's College of Maine. Marianne was the first year coordinator at Collin College in Dallas, Te Dallas, Texas for six years, where she was selected for the Outstanding Faculty Award and was nominated for the Advisor of the Year. She has been a faculty member at Cape Cod Community College since 2007 and resides in the Boston area. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Marianne. Dave for that very nice introduction and thank you Shirley Branham for uh, being my wingman here tonight and answering some questions at the end. I'm just starting my camera so I can see all of you um, and we will get going with the program. I'm glad you decided to come and listen to the smart scaling uh, presentation tonight. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy it and I hope you'll walk away with some tips on ultrasonic instrumentation and pain management. I would like to start uh, by speaking about a disclaimer. Dense by Serona cannot support or refute the non-Dense by Serona products presented in this presentation. So we will be speaking to products and manufacturers other than uh, Dense by Serona. So this is just a disclaimer that we cannot support or refute their claims. So without further ado, ado I'm going to go into the objectives for the webinar tonight. And we are going to compare and contrast the power lines or the standard inserts, slim inserts, and the area-specific curved inserts. We'll discuss the reasons why you utilize different size inserts. Uh, and we'll certainly talk about the quality of your inserts and what kind of shape they're in. We'll look at it from the standpoint of deposit level. Do we have heavy deposit? Do we have biofilm? Do we have just soft deposit? Uh, so we'll also talk about insert selection uh, in reference to that. Uh, we'll be speaking about incorporating minimally, minimally invasive protocols for pain management in the non-surgical periodontal procedures. Uh, we'll discuss the comparison of needing an injectable versus a topical, when do we use one or the other, and when is a non-injectable a good option. And finally, we're going to end up with identifying proper maintenance and sterilization protocols because you can have the best equipment, the best instruments uh, around, but you have to take care of them to, in order to extend the life of your uh, instruments and equipment. Alrighty. I always like to start these presentations with a discussion of the evidence-based approach, and that's how we practice dentistry, that's how we practice good decision-making, and when it comes to um, ultrasonic instrumentation, there really is a plethora of evidence out there now to support ultrasonic instrumentation versus hand instrumentation to really do an excellent job, uh, not only with deposit removal, but with biofilm disruption. And that's really where we're focusing in order to decrease the inflammation. So the evidence is there, and also for anesthetics, for non-injectables, etc. cetera, um, the evidence is definitely there. The clinician's expertise, and that's where um, I'm going to focus on tonight. And we all like to think that we're experts in what we do on some level, and some of us are seasoned and a little bit older, and, and we like to think that we're experts. But I'll tell you, ultrasonic instrumentation is not something that is learned in quite depth in, in colleges. Back, certainly, when I went to school, it's definitely better. Uh, but in my generation, we did a little bit more learn on your own. So becoming an expert in ultrasonic in instrumentation uh, takes a while. And we, we need to be able to step back. And if we're going to practice evidence-based dentistry, uh, we need to really look at what we're doing as far as technique. And are we staying up with the skills that we need to? And finally, the patient's needs and preferences. And that, that is such a big part of the equation. Uh, if the patient is not comfortable, uh, if they're jumping, if they're moving, if they report that they don't like ultrasonic instrumentation, could be a user error. It could be that they had a bad experience in the past, 
and hopefully we're going to provide you with some tips tonight that will turn that experience around and really incorporate the patient's needs and preferences. Because we know the patient is our walking advertisement. They're the one that's going to say they had a great experience. They're going to build our recall system. They're going to come back because they had a good experience. So all three of these I'm going to touch on tonight uh, regarding ultrasonic instrumentation and pain management. So achieving successful debridement, that is the end goal. That's what we're trying to do. And the only way we're going to have successful debridement is with thorough instrumentation. So what does that mean? We all like to think that we're thorough. We do our very best to be thorough. Uh, we're on tight time. Uh, we all know we're very scheduled. But several things have to happen in order to have successful debridement and successful outcomes. First of all, we have to be able to contact the root surface. We need to get where we need to go. We need to go to the depth of the pocket. We need to navigate that anatomy and, and really uh, be able to access everywhere. And truthfully, with ultrasonics, we cannot do that with one insert. We cannot do that necessarily with a straight insert. And I would really like that message to come home tonight that you really truly need more than one ultrasonic insert to get a thorough debridement and a good clinical outcome. Whatever you're using has to be effective. It has to be efficient. It, it's got to get the job done. It's got to be predictable. And I am going to speak about predictable outcomes as well. Um, and I want you to think about your cell phone. We all are very attached to our cell phones. Uh, in my job, I rely on the navigator. I, I rely on using that. And I predict that my phone is going to work. And if it doesn't work, it's chaos. And I think we all know that feeling when it dies in the middle of something we're doing. What we're using has to have predictable, consistent outcomes. So having the right tools, the right equipment, having a smart procedure is imperative to get the job done. So effective, efficient, we need to be mindful of the effect on the root surface. So when we're down debriding, we're down in those root structures, we want to be careful we're not using an insert that's too heavy, that's too aggressive on that cementum. If our patients are anesthetized, they won't give us that body language, and we could really be doing more harm to the root surface than good. Patients got to be comfortable. If the patient, again, is moving, uh, they're not comfortable, it's not going to be a good experience for anyone. And ergonomically speaking, Boy, this is definitely a time when the spotlight is on ergonomic issues. And not only uh, certainly in dentistry, but again, the cell phone, for example. So many of us are down looking on that cell phone, uh, having neck issues. So ergonomics is critical for the life of your career as a clinician. So all of those things need to play a role consistently, predictably, in order to have excellent clinical outcomes. So when I spoke a few minutes ago about schools and um, uh, when students go to school, they learn six months at least of hand instrumentation. And when it's time to learn ultrasonics and the faculty will say, okay, we're going to learn ultrasonics today, we're excited. We're thinking this is the end of, this, of the prayers. Uh, the ultrasonics is going to be great. Truth is, once clinicians use ultrasonics for a while, they get frustrated. So if you're one to get frustrated with ultrasonics and you put it down and you end up picking those hand instruments up, generally it's from insert wear. It's from not utilizing the correct insert or your insert is worn down. And I think everybody knows what I'm speaking about. And it, truly, at the end of the day, it's not acceptable to use things that are not in very good shape. Um, so we're going to speak about that as far as clinician frustration. Dentistry is stressful enough. So if we can take any of that stress out, that, that's what we want to do. Efficiency plus comfort is going to increase recare. So with ultrasonic scaling, the better we do with that, the more increased our recare, the more our patient's going to come back, and it's going to be a win-win combination. But those two things really need to play a role together. When we look at uh, ultrasonics, uh, boy, the units have come a long way. This is a slide depicting several images of piezoelectric uh, uh, ultrasonic technology as well as the magnetostrictive technology. Um, and we will speak to both, uh, but we will speak on the differences regarding um, application and adaptation and how we use one technology versus the other. 
Um, but in general, really, technology has come a long way with these units. Um, and the Cavitron unit that was uh, released uh, about two years ago, really a game changer. This is a fabulous unit, and you can see it here on the screen. Uh, it's got like an iPad touch screen, um, a sliding power knob, and uh, it's got a it rinse mode. It's got preset uh, options, so you can preset what your patient uh, enjoys as far as a power level. It's got tap-on technology. But the, but the winner here is the handpiece. I'm going to show you a quick video, and uh, you'll take a look and see how that handpiece rotates and how light it is. The exclusive Sterimate 360 swivel handpiece allows the clinician to fully rotate and insert, and also allows adjustable hand positioning with free-flowing movement, providing ergonomic benefits. The Sterimate 360 provides the clinician with access within the entire oral cavity. To rotate the ultrasonic insert, place fingers on the nose of the handpiece and rotate to your desired position. So again, that aspect of the Cavitron Touch truly as a clinician is my favorite aspect. And, and, and the technology is very cool. It's a beautiful unit. Uh, it's got some great features. Again, the tap-on technology is great. Also, it produces less heat, less water, and less noise. So that combination along with the light, lightweight handpiece is gonna give a better patient experience. It really is a, a nice ride, if you will. And I hope you can get to try the, the touch uh, in the near future. So smart scaling, what do we mean by smart scaling? Um, I think we all like to think that we, we make smart choices, but smart scaling is again linked to predictable outcomes. So if we choose the right inserts, so we choose the right instruments and we keep them in good shape, we choose the best technology that we can, um, better clinical outcomes are going to be a result. Less stress, patients comfortable, clinicians comfortable, it's really a nice flow, a, a nice workflow to get really great results. Let's talk a little bit about ultrasonic instrumentation techniques because along with having really good equipment, great instruments, great inserts, great technology, you've got to have a good technique that certainly plays a very big role um, with, with those great clinical outcomes. So I'm going to start this part of it speaking about the three A's and for some of you that will resonate back to hygiene school um, as far as the three A's of hand instrumentation. But we kind of morphed this a little bit and related it to ultrasonic instrumentation. So the first is adaptation. The rule of thumb is you want to have about two to three, maybe four millimeters of adaptation of that terminal insert end against the tooth surface. Angulation, about 15 degrees. We know with hand instruments it's a much wider angulation. Activation, short one to two millimeter overlapping strokes. And truly clinicians kind of are all over the board with those three features, those three fundamental features. So if we can look at those tonight and kind of step back and see what we're doing with our instrumentation, uh, we might get a better results clinically. So let's look a little closer at that two to three millimeters of terminal end. You can see in this picture here, the ultrasonic insert is against the tooth surface like it should be, but once the clinician is situated like that, we're going to open a little bit to about a 15 degree angulation. Now you can see it's contacting in the yellow part, but the effective area is the green. So that's really where we want to be adapting to the tooth surface, and that's where we're going to get our oscillation, that's where we're going to get our ultrasonic benefits. So this picture here shows on the left the correct angulation, on the right the clinician floats subgingively and opens about 15 degrees to the correct angulation. So why, when you're working tomorrow back at work, kind of look at that angulation and see if you're about 15 degrees. Obviously in this picture here, wow, uh, that is opening beyond that 15 degree angulation. That's probably at about a 35 degree angulation. And that is toe on. And we don't want to be toe on to that cementum because that's going to do some damage to that root structure. Again, if your patient is anesthetized, they're not going to give you that body language. Um, and certainly could be a problem. 
that is what we would consider an iatrogenic insult or problem. That was clinician induced. And if we do any scratches, if you will, in the cementum, we know the biofilm is going to be retained in those scratches. So adaptation and angulation are two married concepts, if you will. Very important to have both. On the left, you can see that the periodontal probe has about two to three millimeters of adaptation. Same time, it has about 15 degrees angulation. So the probe is staying with the tooth, staying one with the tooth. On the right, you can see that there is about zero degree angulation and truly have lost adaptation. So this is a good example of perhaps some of those probers that are, are considered heavy handers. And maybe this is really what's going on. They have lost the clinging to that anatomy of that tooth. So angulation, adaptation is critical when we're doing ultrasonic instrumentation. As far as the stroke pattern, with uh, magnetostrictive technology, we're seeing an elliptical stroke pattern. And that means it goes in a more kind of oval shape. The benefit of that type of a stroke pattern is that each side of that ultrasonic insert is active and usable. So we have the face that's usable, the back, and the lateral sides. We can certainly use the point, but the point has the most power, and that should only be directed at the deposit. So again, magnetostrictive has an orbital or an elliptical stroke pattern. The value is that of that is that you can use all those surfaces. Creates efficiency when we're scaling. Uh, the piezo um, electric, on the other hand, works in a linear stroke. Okay, so it's more like so. The clinician must be mindful of adapting those lateral surfaces. We cannot adapt the face or the back with the piezo, with most piezoelectric inserts. Uh, those of you that use piezoelectric will will know and attest to if you're using the face or the back, you'll hear kind of that chattering noise, and you'll know that you're using the wrong side of that insert. So the key core difference of the two technologies is that magnetostrictive, all surfaces have energy and are active. You can utilize them all. And that really helps with that hand movement down a quadrant. Um, linear stroke with the piezoelectric, utilize the lateral surfaces. So perhaps a little bit more hand movement uh, when it comes to the technique. So approaching the cal calculus, let's talk about that. How do we get at it? Truly, two different strokes when we talk about biofilm disruption or soft light deposit versus calculus removal. So we're going to be talking about a sweeping motion or, or a shading motion uh, when we're talking about light deplacking, light deposits, two to three millimeter. But if we're talking about deposit, we really literally need to tap at that deposit, microfracture that deposit. So here you can see the clinician will come down on the top of that deposit, microfracture it, but we must come at it from different angles. After that, we're going to go back to that sweeping stroke so we can assess and understand how we did as far as removing the deposit. At the end of the day, we really need to be able to assess with what's in our hand just as well as with an, with an 1112 Explorer. I love this picture here because it really speaks to what's going out there um, as far as the general population. There's a lot of that upper left uh, diagram going on. Um, a lot of people with ultrasonics, a lot of clinicians will go down subgingively, and it's kind of an erratic, um, patternless motion, kind of like that picture there. And, um, you know, if there's a lot of deposit, that kind of a stroke might be okay. Uh, but there really needs to be a methodical channeled effect to it. And this picture that you see here, you can see that linear concavity on this bicuspid, and you can see the deposit right in that linear groove or that linear concavity. If we're having that haphazard all over the place type stroke, we're probably going to miss that deposit inside that concavity. And what will be the end result? The patient's not going to resolve. They're going to come back. There's going to be inflammation probably still in that area, maybe some bleeding. And as much as we like to say it's the home care perhaps they're not doing, or maybe the diabetes or the, the oral systemic, which definitely needs to be considered during assessment, but I think it's critical that we look at that clinician expertise, that second part of evidence-based decision-making, and say, are we removing it thoroughly? 
are we doing a methodical overlapping stroke? Do we have inserts that can get to the base of that pocket? Do we have inserts that conform correctly? It's a question we need to step back and ask ourselves because we don't want to do anything halfway. You know, we, we try our best to get the deposit out as best we can. But truly, you're only as good as what's in your hands. You, you've got to have good instruments, good equipment, good technology, but you also need to go in a very methodical approach. Similar to the right, you see that channeled stroking. Starting at the distal line angle, up and down, making our way across. This is a very nice picture of channeled stroking. We're going to go up and down and up and down. Now, when we go into the mesial or we go into the distal and we're trying to get in this area here, that is the beauty of the magnetostrictive, where we can use the back of the insert to come in to the mesial and distal because it has that elliptical approach. And then when you add on top of that a handpiece that has a rotation to it, it's, it's really beautiful floating as far as using all surfaces and being able to get into proximal nicely um, like we need to. We need to do that channeled overlapping stroke. So let's speak now. Let's move into the power of selection. Let's move into utilizing access adaptation and that activation and make some smart choices, do some smart scaling choices uh, because patients certainly come in all shapes and forms. We know all our patients look different and I want to repeat that you just can't get the whole job done with one insert. You just can't. And, and that being said, I always like to be very mindful of cost and overhead and um, be respectful of, of, of a budget within an office. But on the same token, we know that our doctors are not drilling with burrs that are worn down. Uh, we know that we, we don't get results certainly with that. That's not optimal. That's not the standard of care. So we need to kind of apply that to the hygienist as well and recognize that worn down instruments or using one instrument is not going to get the job done. Let's talk about selection. We need to look at the type of deposit. Is it heavy? Is it light? And then decide are we going to use a standard power line or are we going to choose the slim family? That's going to also tell us about amplitude of the amount of stroke that we need. And we'll talk a little bit about stroke range in just a minute. We're also going to consider the anatomy. Is it a straight tooth, like an incisor or a bicuspid even, or is it a multi-rooted tooth? Is there frication involvement? Then we're into a more curved anatomy. In the curved anatomy, a straight insert is just not going to adapt correctly. It's just not going to get there the way you need to. Gingival biotype, that's something we're hearing more and more about, especially with implant placement. The gingival biotype must be considered. Is it somebody that has a very thick gingiva, a very, um, the patients that have the gummy smiles, for example, uh, or is it a thin, almost parchment paper, uh, very thin gingival biotype? We want to consider what type of insert we're going to use in reference to that as well. That's going to help us decide what diameter that we should use. So it's truly not just a matter of one insert, uh, one universal insert, which is really not, uh, it's a misnomer. Uh, we do need definitely more than one to get the job done. I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about staged instrumentation. And if somebody hasn't been in a long time, they have a lot of heavy deposit, uh, we want to do initially what's called a gross or, or an initial debridement to remove that gross, heavy calculus. And that's what we would use a power or a standard line for. And then we're going to do a little bit more of a definitive debridement with a lighter, thinner insert. So it's a two-stage process. Unless we have a very light patient that only needs a, the debridement, that only needs the deplacking of the light deposit. But with heavy deposit, it really is a one two punch, if you will. We need to go in first and remove the heavy deposit with an appropriate insert, and then go back in with a lighter insert to remove that biofilm and not hurt that cementum. So here's an example of the different tip shape options. We've got straight, as you can see on the left. And some of them have some bends to the shanks. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then we have the curves. And some of you uh, use the curves, some don't. And we'll speak to those uh, in just a few minutes. So they really are different. 
a lot of the, the green insert that you see there, the Slim 10, very, very popular insert. Um, different manufacturers certainly make this. Um, it is the Slim line, it's a straight Slim line, very popular insert. But what happens is people try to make this Slim line do everything. So they're trying to use it on heavy deposit and they're wearing the insert down faster than it needs to. Not only that, the slim line and the power line, the standard line, have different stroke ranges. And let me go back to that slide in just a minute here. I want you to look at this slide. You can see that these inserts are very differently made. What the arrows are pointing to on these magnetostricted inserts is the connecting body. And that's what drives the stroke. That's what designs what type of stroke each insert is going to make. These are beautifully made of the USA inserts, and if you ever take a look at your inserts when you go back, take a look at those different connecting bodies. And what does that mean to you? It means that the standard or the power line, due to the connective body, is going to be able to produce a stroke range that's different than the slim line. So the blue power line can go longer or bigger, and a bigger stroke is a more powerful stroke. The slim is just never going to be able to produce that stroke length. So keep that in mind as we uh, talk about decision making uh, in just a few minutes. We're going to start out talking about plaque biofilm disruption, our lighter patients. And we're going to talk about um, what we would use in those instances. Always want to maintain a feather light touch. You know, you don't want to be doing the work. You don't want to be engaging any kind of lateral pressure. You should be light, you should be soft, and especially with these uh, lighter patients with just plaque biofilm. Again, adaptation, two to four millimeters should be clinging to that tooth surface and short overlapping strokes. So let's talk about our choices when it's light biofilm or calculus. Here is the thin insert or the um, extra thin insert. Again, many manufacturers make it. This is the Cavitron thin insert. Uh, beautiful insert if you have not used it. Um, super thin, very light, does a beautiful job. And if you do use the slim family, this Cavitron thin insert is 47% thinner than the slim line. So very, very nice, slips into those tight tissues fantastic tactile sensitivity, and we'll speak to that in just a second. Uh, but it allows access to difficult areas. If we've got some misalignment, some crowding, some tight, tight contacts, it allows us to get underneath there. It can be utilized at all power levels. So if we're doing a quadrant scaling, and we're using the thin insert, for example, we've already gotten the heavy deposit off, and we're getting the lighter deposit off. We have, there was a study done just, just came out a couple of months ago, comparing the 1112 Explorer, which is the standard of, 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 of use as far as in exploring on you know, those root structures. The study compared the 1112 Explorer with the Thinsert. And with the Thinsert not activated without, without the pedal on, had equal ability to feel that deposit underneath the tissue similar to the uh, 1112 Explorer. What does this mean? This means a lot as far as efficiency. So we're not working and reaching over for that 1112 Explorer and going in and really feeling if we remove that deposit and then putting it back down again and picking the insert back up again. You know, we, we hear sometimes that the clinicians don't want to change out that, that, that insert and use more than one. So, you know, I, I struggle imagining picking up that 1112 Explorer, but we've got to assess. We've got to go back in and assess whether we truly got that deposit off. And this insert does that. So it has the ability to have tactile sensitivity. And if you reach some kind of heavy deposit, this insert can go up to high power. So really tremendous insert on many levels. Um, and again, it has that ability to have great tactile sensitivity. I'm going to um, play a quick video clip so you can see it in motion. It really is um, a very neat insert. This is the Cavitron FSI Thinsert. This insert is 47% thinner than the Cavitron FSI Slimline 10. It provides access in difficult areas, including misalignments, interproximal surfaces, and areas of tight tissue. The Cavitron FSI Thinsert is ideal for completion of a staged instrumentation sequence 
to assess the areas for remaining deposit while performing thorough biofilm disruption. It is designed for removal of light to moderate calculus and deplacking. This sensor can be used at all power levels. After the clinician has filled the handpiece with water, seated the insert, selected the power, and adjusted the spray properly, instrumentation begins according to the treatment plan prescribed for the patient. The clinician will begin on the clinical crown, mindfully adapting 2 to 3 millimeters and angulating the insert no more than 15 degrees to the long axis of the tooth. The strokes are small, 1 to 2 millimeter overlapping to ensure thorough debridement of the biofilm in any light deposits. Due to the ultra-thin diameter of this insert, it is imperative to maintain 2 to 3 millimeters adaptation of the lateral and or back surfaces of the insert at all times. Once the clinician has approached the line angle, the clinician will adapt more obliquely to allow adaptation under the contact. So great insert, uh, again multi-purposed, really nice on our healthy patients uh, that don't have a lot of deposit, have tight tissues, um, the access is really phenomenal. Great tactile sensitivity. And again, we really should be able to feel what's underneath our instrument. Uh, we are working in the dark, and it's certainly nice to have an insert that can help us feel. Moving into uh, the slim line, uh, the slim line comes in a straight, it comes in a triple bend, and it comes in the curved rights and lefts. So if you look at the triple bend there, the second one down, you'll see that it has kind of a beveled edge to it. The beauty of a triple bend, if you were to look at it in cross section, it is shaped like a coin or a diamond shape. So the energy kicks off those corners in a unique way versus the straight inserts in a circular fashion. I'm going to show you a video that will help explain this, but the triple bend insert is really quite nice. So as you can see, that beveled edge or that coined edge uh, really helps on those line angles, helps with that tenacious deposit uh, and really gets the job done nicely. The triple bend inserts are really very popular. I don't know about you, but I love to watch those videos. Love to see that deposit coming off. Got to think about that anatomy. So the slimmer inserts are able to navigate that anatomy, get into those convexities, slip into those areas that are super thin, uh, and, and truly the, the standard or the power line shouldn't be navigating that type of terrain. Those are for your heavier deposit, breaking up the heavier deposit, then we switch to the lighter insert. Again, think about we wouldn't use one hand instrument to do the whole job. So we have the straight and these slim lines we want to utilize them at a low to medium power. The triple bend, however, the 1000, we can use that at a higher power. Okay, we're going to move into the curved inserts or the right and the left. And clinicians will look at these and they're either, they're, they'll, they'll either use them and love them or they're not sure how to use them or they'll use them the wrong way and they'll put them at the end of the, at the back of the drawers. And I'm here to tell you, if you use curved inserts, especially for your perio patients, and I see a clinician using a curved insert, I know their game is up. I know that they're navigating that terrain, they're getting into those furcations, they're getting where they need to go, and they know that. It's predictable. It's smart scaling. They're using something that they know is going to reach the depth of the pocket. Curved inserts are super important, but we need to know how to use them and use them properly. I'm going to show a quick video on this in just a second. I want to just show this picture here. On the left, you can see it's a straight insert, and on the right is a curved insert. Upon initial entry, they look okay. They look like they're adapting pretty well. When we go a little bit deeper, 
you can see on the left, we have lost adaptation. We have probably half a millimeter of adaptation. We are toe on. So if the patient, again, is anesthetized, they're not going to feel it. They're not going to give you that body reaction. You could be gouging that root surface. You could be really doing some damage to that cementum, causing hypersensitivity, etc. So we need to utilize something that we know is going to adapt. Not something that we hope is adapting, but something that we know is going to adapt. Let me show you a video on the rights and lefts. Understanding the area-specific design of these inserts is essential for proper adaptation. The clinician must be able to identify the inserts by recognition of the shank and direction of the curvature of the tip. Memorizing colors or trying to read the stacks can be challenging and prove confusing for the clinician. Adapting the curved insert properly requires a fundamental knowledge of the tooth's anatomy and proper placement on the appropriate tooth surface. In order to identify which insert one is holding, it is recommended to begin by holding the inserts parallel to the floor with the points facing down or perpendicular to the floor with the points facing away from the clinician. The right insert will curve to the right and the left will curve to the left. It is also helpful to place the insert on the occlusal of the intended tooth as demonstrated here to see the curvature to ensure you selected the correct insert. After this is established, maintain a vertical approach and notice that the back of the insert is adapted to the surface you are entering. Utilization of all surfaces is indicated for proper adaptation in periodontal pockets interproximally. Begin on the clinical crown, float subgingively, riding the anatomy and clinging to the pellicle while always maintaining 2-3 to three millimeters of adaptation and no more than 15 degrees angulation. Navigating the pocket, Assess while entering and engage any deposit encountered with a gentle tap. Frequent, methodical, overlapping strokes are essential in the periodontal pocket to detoxify and debride every square millimeter. A haphazard approach will leave deposit and biofilm behind and limit the patient's response to therapy. As the clinician proceeds towards the interproximal area, proper adaptation is achieved by staying with the anatomy and following the topography of the pocket. Once thorough instrumentation has been achieved, the clinician returns to the line angle and with a vertical adaptation proceeds with channel stroke across the buckle allowing for tactile sensitivity to drive the stroke engagement. So there you have it. The videos truly speak volumes as far as that proper adaptation with the clear gingiva. You can see that that millimeter, two to three millimeter is happening one with the tooth and staying with the tooth while we ride that anatomy. All these videos are available on the Dent Supply Serona website. Um, at the end of this uh, CE, we will show you those web links. They're also available on YouTube, so you can go back and really look at these in your own time uh, and watch that proper adaptation and activation. So let's move on to the heavier deposit. Let's, let's move on to the patient that has that deposit that we need to tap at in microfracture. We're still going to have a light feather touch, but we're going to do it with a little bit of a tap to engage and, and, and remove that deposit. So our standard or our power lines come in different shapes as well. We've got the straight, we've got one with a single bend, and then one again with the triple bend. And whenever we do these presentations and we'll ask in the room how many of you use the, the standard or the power line triple bend, you see the faces light up and the smiles and to know a triple bend is to love a triple bend. And again, those, those coined edges really kick at that calculus at the line angles. Um, it does a beautiful job. So if you haven't tried one, I suggest that you look into it. Here is um, the 10, power line 10, which is a straight, obviously, um, standard insert, uh, moderate uh, to heavy deposits, all power levels. And with the newer uh, technology, the newer uh, equipment, we can ride that power up higher. We don't want to stay necessarily in this blue zone so much anymore. Um, you need power, you need power, and these inserts can handle it. So we want to be able to utilize power if we need it. Here is the 1000, which again works similar to the video clip we just showed you on that slim line. Really great insert. But this is an insert that is not talked about enough, in my opinion. This is the Powerline 3 of the Beaver Tail. 
The beauty of this insert is that it has a rounded toe or a blunted toe. So you can come in a little bit more straight on and it lifts that calculus off just beautifully. If so, if we've got ledges, if you will, it takes it off in bigger pieces. If you've got heavy stain and you don't have a cookie jet, in, and you've got a smoker or someone with that iron stain, a lingual of those uh, maxillary molars, beaver tail is beautiful for stain removal. Let's watch a video clip of this. The number three beaver tail will be demonstrated on the mandibular anterior region. The beaver tail insert is utilized for the removal of heavy deposits in this area. Once the foot pedal is activated, the clinician approaches the deposit in more of a straight-on approach due to the blunted tip of this insert. Adapting the insert under the deposit allows the calculus to break free in large pieces, allowing for more efficient removal. There is a slight vertical stroke when a ledge of calculus is lifted from the tooth. So if you have not tried that beaver tail number three insert, I highly recommend you try it. It really is a nice experience. Uh, and for those patients that present with a lot of deposit, it, it's going to be it's going to be really nice for you. It really lifts it off much quicker, much more efficient. All right, let's move into monitoring inserts. Okay, you, you've got to monitor your inserts. You've got to see where they're at. We all know about dull hand instruments. We know what that means. But monitoring inserts is something that really is kind of a gray situation. People don't do it enough, and therefore we we sit down, we open up our autoplay bags, we pull it out, and we get frustrated and we start using it and we know, we intuitively know it's worn down and that's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling to, to recognize that we're using something that's not in the best shape. It causes stress and it detracts from the patient. It, it detracts from enrolling operative dentistry. It really, my hypothesis is if you were, if hygienists were to have two minimum inserts in really good shape on a regular basis that they could be consistently knowing that they're having my hypothesis is that production would increase dramatically. I have not proved that as of yet, but my thoughts are um, if you're not stressed by needing to pick up a different insert or, or, or you don't have one ready, uh, it just affects everybody negatively in the long run. So let's talk about insert wear. Theory of insert wear actually has been proven. Uh, we do know that two millimeters of wear is an efficiency loss of about 59%. So you can see that picture on the right of the orbital elliptical stroke that the magnetostrictor, for example, makes. If we wear that insert back, it's going to be 59% efficiency loss. So take a look again at that picture. We're not able to do that same stroke length. So we're not covering as much area. We're not being effective. We're not being efficient. And we're getting frustrated. So let's take a look at, at something in just a second. This, this study that we looked at also discussed that a worn insert of about two millimeters increases the scaling time 30% and the clinician exerts about 40% more force. So what does that mean for the patient? Think about it while we watch this video clip. Selecting the appropriate ultrasonic insert based on the type of deposit and anatomy can have an impact on scaling efficiency and comfort. Another key to optimizing performance is using a well-maintained ultrasonic insert. Did you know that the last four millimeters of the tip is referred to as the active area? This area is responsible for the removal of calculus and biofilm. As the tip wears from use over time, this lost length translates into a loss of efficiency. In this test, we compared a new Cavitron ultrasonic insert to a Cavitron ultrasonic insert with only two millimeters of wear. On average, the worn insert results in a 30% increase in total scaling time. In addition, a clinician will use 40% more scaling force over the course of the procedure. This may result in an increase in both patient chair time and pressure used by the clinician while scaling. What could you do with 30% more time? 
Check your inserts regularly to maximize efficiency and comfort for you and your patients. I think we're all thinking about what we could do with an extra uh, time, certainly on our schedule. But, but yes, it speaks to having a freer flow moving through the day easier and certainly less stressful. So have your inserts monitored either, either by yourself by using one of these insert guides. Every manufacturer makes one for their particular line of inserts or tips. Have them on hand, measure them. Uh, Cavitron has introduced and has a mobile app and the sales team can come out, a sales representative can come out and actually measure your inserts. They can do a lunch and learn and, and measure what you have there and it sure is nice to be able to see that red and know that it's worn down. The doctor sees it more easily. It's a little bit more um, transferable, if you will, as far as the information. Uh, and, and they're the ones that are saying X amount of inserts are worn down. And before, before the end of the presentation, I'll speak to that a little bit more so. But, you know, all, all these manufacturers, I'm sure, have the ability to have people come out and measure. Regardless, somebody's going to measure these inserts and stay on task with it because we don't want to be using equipment that's not up to par. It's, it's not a good outcome for our patients. Okay, coming down the home stretch here, we are going to speak to um, anesthetic options for non-surgical periodontal therapy. Uh, and you know, uh, certainly in the United States and, and globally as well, there are many hygienists that can give local anesthesia, and that's great. It is a skill that we are trained to do and, and do quite well and, and do often. But I think we need to think about, is that our first line? And it should it be our first line. Do we need that injectable every single time? Are we providing maybe too much anesthesia? Some interesting statistics about uh, patient reception of uh, comfort. 84% of perio recall patients report tooth sensitivity. 82% of periodontal recall patients prefer a non-injectable anesthetic gel over an injection and 63% of patients who preferred a non-injectable anesthetic gel would be more willing to return for recall if they knew a non-injectable option was available. And, and I think that's where we sometimes drop the ball, that we, we're not making it known to our patients that that is available. And it is a great option. And often that will turn the corner for a patient that's not sure if they want to have the procedure done. And uh, perhaps they're not rescheduling or not showing up for those quadrant appointments uh, when they know they're going to have to get that shot. Sometimes that's, that's more intimidating than anything. So when we talk about instrumentation of the subgingival environment, we really have to consider these factors. Number one, what is the patient's periodontal condition? Do they have fours, a few fives? Uh, is it a pretty straightforward, simplistic situation? What type of anesthesia are we going to choose? What is the patient's pain threshold? You know, that, that, that runs the gamut, and we need to get a good understanding of that. And I think that you'll agree that this third factor, the clinician skill level, plays a huge role. And I like to consider myself a clinician that can get in there, get where I need to get done without really causing too much discomfort for the patient. Uh, I think that's equated to skill. I think it's equated to using the correct armamentarium, the correct equipment, the correct technique, but I wouldn't necessarily want to give an injectable to each patient if they didn't need one. So we want to stay in that standard of care and do the right thing and provide optimal care going in the least invasive approach. When we talk about topical anesthetic agents, truly the most common use in dentistry is anesthesia at the site prior to the uh, injection. So that's generally what these topical anesthetics are known for, the benzocanes. 20% benzocaine family, and uh, you know, using a little bit on that cotton swab, putting it in the area, that's, that's the usual use of these benzocaine type products. We've got the gels, the toe packs, the hurricane, the uh, lolicane, etc. Uh, and then we've got the combo uh, ester drugs, which is the benzocaine, the butamine, and the tetracaine combination, which really is a pretty strong combination as far as the topical anesthetic. What we need to consider when we're looking at topical anesthetics is that the concentration of these anesthetics is higher than the injectables, and that's because it has to uh, go through a vascular absorption. And it doesn't have the epinephrine in it, so the concentration itself needs to be higher. 
So why is that a problem? Why is that a consideration? Because dosing and application, if used in non-surgical periodontal therapy, many clinicians are overdosing and overapplying some of these benzocaine products. And it's a problem. We really need to read those instructions in order to deliver the correct treatment, the correct amount. Some of the local reactions we can have from these topical anesthetics are tissue sloughing, delayed hypersensitivity, and that hypersensitivity is not really going to present chair size. When they get home, they could have some hypersensitivity. They could have redness, pain, burning at the application site. And truly, remember, these are ester drugs. These are ester products. So benzocaine and tetracaine combined is, again, a more powerful drug, and they're more likely to cause that contact sensitivity. So think about that when you're choosing what you're going to use for your non-surgical patients. Contraindications to benzocaine topicals if there are allergies to the PAVA-type derivative products, those PAVA amino uh, benzoic acid type products. Uh, people have sensitivity to the esters. That's why we did away with the esters as far as injectables and moved into the AMI family. So esters are a problem. Some of the um, uh, over-the-counter ester-type benzocaine products actually have FDA warnings on them. Uh, so we need to consider dosage, we need to consider medical histories, we need to consider um, how we're using them. And some of the products, uh, as you can see here, uh, actually states on the directions for use, do not use on large areas of denuded or inflamed tissues. I, I think we need to step back and ask ourselves when we're doing a scale root plane, what, what is the tissues like? Uh, they tend to be inflamed. So uh, really need to read that product information leaflet. Uh, here is the uh, dosage that we should be using on a cetacaine topical. 200 milligrams, half an inch long. You can see the amount that we should be using there, and it's about this much as far as the topical gel of surface area. This is per visit. This is not per quadrant. It's not per section. It's per visit. When we use the liquid cetacaine product, it's about the same 0.2 milliliters, very small amount, 200 milligram, and uh, I'll tell you, I think a lot of clinicians go back and use more than that, twice as much, three times as much, um, but it also states that excess of 400 milligram of this product is contraindicated. So again, we're all guilty of not reading our instructions too much, but these extra drugs, we've got to be careful of overdosing and using too much of it. So one application, 0.2 milliliters, is the amount we should be using of uh, this cetacaine product as far as using it for non-surgical therapy. So what do we ask ourselves when we're comparing these drugs? Are there medical contraindications? Are there any met hemoglobinemia uh, experience, which is an anemic type problem where the blood doesn't transfer the oxygen well enough? It's been linked to some of these over-the-counter benzocaine products, some anesthetic products in general. Uh, but Oftentimes, we won't see this immediately, so we've got to check those contraindications, check that medical history. Our pregnant patients, some of these non-injectable topical anesthetics are safer than others. How much treatment area are we, are we looking at? Are we looking at a quadrant? Are we looking at a whole mouth debridement? Maybe we don't need to do the whole mouth as far as we could not do an injectable with that procedure. So we need to look at the duration. We need to look at if it's FDA approved. For the procedure and how do I utilize it again we need to think is it an ester or an AMI drug so let's look at the non injectable know your drug classification if we take a look at all these drugs here these topicals if you will in non injectables there's only one here that's an AMI that AMI we know is a safer choice all the others are ester drugs so we've got to factor that in and think about that especially in relationship to how we're dosing Oracix, many of you are familiar with. It's a, it's a eutectic mixture of lidocaine and prilocaine, 2.5% of each. Uh, again, we want to be very careful that we're reading all of the uh, product information leaflet. Uh, it is not for injection, but it is a non-injectable, subgingival, FDA-approved product for scale root plane. When we're using the Oracix product, it's important to use enough. We find that people don't use enough of the Oracix and complain they have too much left over in the carpule, uh, but they're overdosing on the other products. So we want to make sure that we're applying to the gingival margin first. 
We want to sit for about 30 seconds, then we want to go to the deepest pocket reading and start depositing the anesthetic. We wait till it exudes from the pocket, and we start walking down the pocket, releasing the anesthetic as we go. So truly, probably think about using a little bit more, and we get some real nice, profound, soft tissue anesthesia with the, with the Oracase product. It's a safe product. The ultrasonic uh, water does not dilute it, so it's safe to use an ultrasonic with it. You won't reduce the efficacy of the product. Uh, it is nice to use Oracix in combination with an injectable drug. So if you wanted some of that epinephrine, some of that vasoconstriction, uh, you can do some infiltration, get some vasoconstriction, but you must remember to do the math. Uh, five cartridges, five cartridges you're able to use in one appointment with Oracix compared to other small quantities of those ester drugs. Uh, but if you're going to use injectable, you've got to do the math. So uh, give Oracix a try. It's really a great first line choice for anesthetic to get our patients comfortable. When we're talking about anesthesia, remember the doctors depend on us to choose what's best for our treatment, choose what we want to use for our patients and make it personalized and individualized. They depend on keeping our patients, they depend on us keeping our patients comfortable and I highly recommend having a practice philosophy where everybody is on the same page as far as what to use when so patients all experience that same personalized choice in treatment uh, pain management. Okay, I'm going to finish up with insert maintenance and open up the board to uh, ask a little bit of questions if you have any. Uh, we want to examine our inserts. We want to look at the insert tip, examine for wear, look at the grip, look at the o-ring, the black little o-ring you see in the center there. If that gets worn down, we can get leakage. And we're dealing with enough water control, we don't need leakage on top of that. You want to look at the stack of the insert and make sure it's not weighty. The stack looks like it's in good shape. And remember, there's this definite lifetime with inserts. And everybody asks how long should they last. Well, it depends on how often you're using them. If you're only using one, it's going to wear down quicker. If you're using a slim one for heavy deposit, it's going to wear down. Uh, but you need to monitor them and you need to replace them when they, when they get to a certain point. Hand pieces, if you can remove it from the unit, it needs to go through the autoclave. CDC recommendation, so when you take it off, you want to remove it, wipe, rinse thoroughly, remove any excess soil. Uh, and I know that this seems cumbersome and it seems like a lot to do, uh, but truly to comply, we need to be uh, running those hand pieces through the autoclave after each use if you can take them off the unit. And you're looking at this picture saying, ah, I can't put my inserts in the ultrasonic box. Well, a couple years ago, we changed our directions for use, and yes, you can put them in the ultrasonic bath, uh, but you want to make sure that you're either hopefully using a cassette, or if not, um, there are several offices that don't, you want to lay them on the floor of the ultrasonic bath and not overload it, not put too many in there. You want to use a solution that's pH neutral, keep them in there for 15 minutes at the, at the most, hopefully, and follow the manufacturer's instructions for whatever type of uh, fluid that you're using. Again, pH neutral. Uh, here's two products here, the Resurge. Uh, very nice product. Not only um, is it pH new neutral and it's good to your inserts, they actually look newer longer. It gives them a nice fresh look. So yes, you can use the ultrasonic bath, uh, but you want to be careful with how you're putting them in there, not overloading as you're doing it. Make sure that you rinse your inserts thoroughly. Dry them really well. Don't put them in the autoclave wet, and uh, that goes whether you're using a cassette or a pouch. And we're coming down on the last slide here, and I'm stuck in here with some microphone. I'm having trouble making it to the next slide. Dave, can you move that slide for me? Okay, here we go. So key points to review. We're right at that hour point. Uh, first one. Perform consistent patient assessments. Look at each patient individually and decide what am I going to need as far as inserts. Get away from that one insert that's going to do the whole thing and select the appropriate insert, especially for your non-surgical periodontal therapy. Use those curved inserts. Ride that anatomy and adapt the way you need to and use that thin insert for exploratory excellence in order to see that you've gotten the job done. Use the least invasive approach when you're looking at pain management for your uh, non-surgical perio patients. You want to provide the optimum level of comfort, effectiveness, and efficiency, and you want predictable outcomes. That's smart scaling. 
So I appreciate your time tonight. I really do. I know we covered a lot. Uh, it was a good full hour. I'm going to open up the question boards. Hopefully some of you have some questions and we'll provide web links that you can go back and look at a lot of this material. Thank you very much, Marianne. Before we start questions, I just want to point out some web links over on the left hand box that says web resources. Um, mobile users. This is one of those times where uh, that box may not work for you. You might have a box that says unsupported content. So what we've done here on the, the very bottom uh, pod, um, we've, we've uh, spelled out the link for you for the C, uh, CE quiz. Uh, screenshot that or write it down while we're going over questions. Um, and you'll have to, unfortunately, type that in manually to get to that CE quiz. That was the only way we could display the link for you guys on mobile. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over, back over to Marianne and Shirley for, for some uh, questions and answers. OK, excellent. Shirley, you with me, yes? OK, I am going to read out um, these questions that are coming in. Do I have to be certified in local anesthesia to administer Orbix? Great question. No, you do not. And again, I think most states are, uh, in the United States, able to provide local, but you do not need to uh, be certified in local anesthesia to use the Orbix, which is nice. I was never trained to put my tips in the ultrasonic bath. Yes, I think most schools will still tell you that. And you know, you're going to do what you're comfortable with, but we can, in fact, put them in the ultrasonic bath. And remember, there's all kinds of nooks and crannies and crevices and places where bacteria can form on these. So truly, it's a, it's a better end result if we do put them in the ultrasonic bath. Shirley, would you like to take a question? Are you on Oh, yes, I am. Or oh, just... Hello, everyone. I okay. see your question. I only use the universal. What insert should I use along besides that? Uh, the universal is generally referred to the slimline 10. So depending on the types of patients you see, it may be that you would maybe need to add the power line for the heavier tenacious calculus, or you would need to then consider the slimline if you see more uh, patients that are maintained very regularly. So that decision would be made um, depending on the type of patients that you see. Okay, I see another one says, can all the inserts be used in high power? And that uh, is definitely a no. So uh, some of the slimmer line inserts, you want to keep the lower power. Um, the power line certainly can go up high. The thin insert can go up high. But remember, you always want to start the lowest power you can. You're going to have better patient comfort and then increase up if you have to. And use the correct instrument ins insert uh, for a power setting. Good question. Shirley? Okay, um, another question. Can I use Orkix when the doctor is not in the practice? Um, that's going to depend on your state practice acts, so we would refer you to that, but um, just to generally answer that, um, the patient would have to already be a patient of record before you could even be tr treating them with the doctor not in the office. So again, um, check with your state practice acts um, as far as whether you can go ahead and treat that patient with Orkix. Um, Okay, and we'll answer two more questions because I know we ran over. Um, question regarding the similarity of piezo with magnetostrictive. Uh, we frequently get that question as far as which has a better outcome. Really, it, it depends on whose hand it's in. And some people are great with piezo, some people are better with magnetostrictive. It depends on the technology you're more comfortable with, frankly. Uh, again, it comes down to the piezo. You want to be mindful of those lateral surfaces. So it might be a little bit more technique sensitive. With the uh, magnetostrictive, you're able to really utilize um, all surfaces. So you know, it, it tends to have to do with the clinician, really. I'm going to wind this down because uh, we did run over a little bit. I do apologize. This webinar was recorded, so you can go back in. Please take your CE quiz. And join us again next time for another uh, webinar event. We love having you on. Thank you and good night.